All right, so this is chapter eight, which is on momentum and collisions. So <clears throat> in this chapter, we're gonna be learning about a um, very important concept called momentum. So um, this is linear momentum. Uh, in chapter 10, we will also learn about angular momentum. So linear momentum basically means that we're still talking about object that has uh, in a way no size and uh, like a particle, right? And moving along, um, you know, more or less a straight line. So that's why we call it linear momentum. All right, so this linear momentum becomes very important when you consider, um, for example, collisions. So when objects collide uh, during the collisions, right? The, when they are interacting, in order for us to be able to describe, let's say the effect of those collisions, um, the linear momentum is the best way to go. Uh, because for example, when you consider a collision and let's say the only information you have, for example, is, uh, is the velocity, that's just not enough information. So imagine, let's say uh, there's gonna be collision. Uh, one collision is, uh, let's say, imagine, like, for example, there is a wall and there are two objects moving with the same velocity and they're gonna collide, okay? So now the effect of the collision, just in terms of velocity, right, is not conclusive because, okay, so both of them have the same velocity, both of them moving toward the wall and they're gonna collide. But, you know, what's gonna be the, the damage done to the wall, you're not gonna know until you're given more information, for example, information like mass. What if one of them is a mosquito, the other one is an elephant? You can imagine, right? The difference in damage done by the one object compared to the other one. So for example, M1 is a mosquito, M2 is an elephant. Even if they're both moving at 10 meters per second, mosquito gonna do almost zero damage, uh, but elephant can do a lot of damage when it hits the wall. That means just the velocity itself is not enough, but including the mass into the, you know, let's say um, factoring out the mass, right? Then we have more information. And that's what we're gonna be doing because when you're talking about collisions specifically, right? Not only the velocity, but also the mass becomes important. And one thing we have here is then the product of mass and velocity is what we define to be the momentum. So that the momentum of the object and the linear momentum of the object, mathematically speaking, is defined as the product of the mass of the object in kilograms times the velocity in meters per second. So M times V. Since velocity is a vector, mass is a scalar, then the quantity itself is a vector. So momentum is a vector, always in the same direction as the velocity. And it has a unit of kilograms times meters per second. So those are the units for the momentum. And in a way you can see that momentum becomes more important when you're dealing with, you know, things like collision. So since it's a vector, that means, you know, we have to treat it as a vector. We have to make sure that, you know, uh, we have uh, components whenever the momentum is two dimensional, which means like velocity is two dimensional, right? So uh, whenever, let's say, instead of object moving let's say along the X or Y, what if the object is moving in this direction with this velocity? Well, since this velocity has X and Y components, so if I multiply this by M, then all of those components will also be, you know, uh, let's say has to be included in the calculation. That means here I have X component of the velocity, here I have Y component of the velocity, then M times VX is the horizontal momentum, M times VY is vertical momentum, we'll go all the way to the, you know, two dimensional, right? You can all go all the way to the two, uh, sorry, three dimensional uh, momentum. We will try to, you know, keep it like, let's say two dimensional in this, in this class as much as we can. So um, we're gonna be uh, working with a lot of one dimensional collisions. And then, you know, I will show you uh, how to deal with the two dimensional, but you can see, right? The momentum being a vector, you can in a way have an object, you know, having a three, you know, uh, momentum with three components. All right, so momentum itself is very, very important. And it's actually a little more even fundamental than, for example, acceleration. 
because here's what we learn about Newton's second law, net force equals mass times acceleration. Well, this is not the second law that Isaac Newton wrote down. His version of second law was completely different. Why? Because what he did, he wrote down the second law in terms of not acceleration, but remember the acceleration is dv dt, right? So he wrote down in terms of, you know, not acceleration. But if you think like this, if you replace acceleration with dv dt and you move the mass into that derivative, so then this becomes d mv dt. And we just learned, right? This quantity m times v is the momentum. So then Isaac Newton wrote down his second law in terms of, well, there's no, in terms of objects changing momentum rather than acceleration, so like let's say. So which is right here. That means the Newton's second law is in terms of if there's a net force, and usually we're gonna see right this in terms of external net force, then the object's momentum will change. So there will be a change in object's momentum only due to uh, some kind of external force. Let's look at like a simple example. So let's say you have a box sitting there. So what is the momentum of the box right now? Well, momentum of the box right now is M times V initial. Well, if the box is at rest, then initial momentum is zero. Now, what do we do to change this momentum? Well, it's obvious we apply force. We apply force, object is moving. Well, if it's moving now, it has a momentum and we changed it, right? We changed the object's momentum because applying force changes the velocity. And if you change the velocity, you're changing the momentum. Can we change the momentum by changing mass? Yes. Are we, do, are we gonna be doing that a lot of that? Probably not. So it's possible that we can change the momentum also by changing mass, because for example, if you have a box, well, if the box is exploding, right, then you have small pieces and things like that, right? So it's still, you know, um, you are breaking that into smaller pieces and things like that, but we can see that we can include something like that in also the calculation of momentum. But for that, we need a system, you know, of, of particles and things like that, and we'll get to that in a little bit later on. All right, so here's then what we have. This is, you know, obviously you can see, right, using this equation, then we can derive to mass times acceleration because if the mass is constant and that's important, right? And uh, using the net force equals MA, we always assume that mass is constant. That means it doesn't change. So we can, you know, kind of go, you know, backward, dmv dt equals M times dv dt, then M times A. So that's what we use right now for convenience. But Newton basically wrote his second law in terms of object's momentum. If object is at rest, it has no momentum, you push it, Momentum changes and the force was responsible for that. All right, now, one of the most important uh, conservation laws we learned in the previous chapter, which is conservation of energy. Well, equally like, let's say important, also the conservation of momentum, which we're gonna, you know, see because, you know, um, conservation of momentum can be used in many, many applications of physics, astronomy, uh, engineering, and things like that. Uh, and just like the conservation of energy that requires a system, right? So let's say, um, same thing is also true for the uh, momentum. So you have an isolated system, the momentum is conserved, which means that the momentum of the system, not with the, not over like, let's say a single particle or something like that. So the momentum of a system uh, is conserved and we were, we're gonna be looking at this, you know, uh, in a greater details in a, in a little bit, right? When we deal with, for example, um, collisions, but the idea here is this. So let's say you have a system, okay? And you have, let's say many particles and they're moving toward each other. And let's say they're colliding and things like that. So if I'm considering this, this, this is a system, let's say before collision, And then, so let's say this is uh, before, and then let's say I look at, you know, after the collision, what's going on and things like that, they basically maybe uh, hit each other, go in opposite direction. But if I look at the momentum of the system, 
which is thing like this. What I do here is I, I say, all right, so momentum of one initially plus momentum of two initially plus momentum of three initially plus that, that, that to give me the total momentum before. If I calculate the total momentum before and then the same thing I do for after, which is final momentum of the total system momentum will be final momentum of one plus final momentum of two plus final momentum of three plus that, that, that. Well, the total momentum before and after is constant. And that's what this represents. So if you have a system of particles and it's isolated from environment, momentum of the system is conserved, okay? And we will be using this quite a lot when we deal with, you know, collisions. In a way, what we, what we also have to take into account is that momentum being a, a vector, you can see that there could be, you know, three independent, let's say equations, which is the momentum conserved in the X direction and momentum conserved in the Y direction and momentum conserved in a Z direction. Because again, and we learned that if we can treat those dimensions, right? The coordinates completely separate from one another. And then whenever we need to, we can just put them together because there's all, there are always things that, you know, links them together. So same thing, we can basically do that here. All right, so, but in any case, so the momentum of the system before and after can be conserved, right? But you need to have a, you know, you need to have a system of particles. If you have one object, you have one object and this object is moving and hitting the wall and then collides with the wall and then bounces back. Well, this object changes momentum for sure. One object, if there's a force acting on it and things like that will change its momentum and the, you know, its momentum is not conserved. But for the system, it can be conserved if you have many, many particles because we're assuming if, if you close your system, if isolate your system from environment, there are no external forces acting on it. And all those, doing all those collisions, forces between them are internal, internal forces, action reaction forces. And those forces do not change the system momentum. So then we will see that later on, right? We can use the same logic to see how the conservation of momentum can be written for the, let's say two colliding particles. All right, so let's do an example here. A three kilogram particle has a velocity of three I hat plus four J hat meter per second. Find the X and Y components of the momentum and find the magnitude and direction of the momentum. So, because we can see, right, our velocity is two dimensional. So we need to write down um, because we have the mass, which is three kilograms and we're given velocity in terms of three I hat plus four J hat, let's say meters per second. Well, it's simple enough, right? So let's say um, what we do is we say, all right, so here's the momentum, which is mass times velocity. So mass times three I hat plus um, plus four J hat. All right, so I think I, I'm just noticing that there, there may be a typo. So this probably should be minus. So let's do that. So this is minus four J hat. All right, so let's go with that. Nothing wrong. I mean, you could do it with the plus to us. It's just let's say uh, to be consistent with the solution that I have. So uh, meters per second. Remember, this is, the, this is the mass, which is I can just write this as three kilograms. So then this becomes three times three is nine I hat minus three times four, so then 12 J hat. So now the units are kilograms meter per second. Okay, which in a way tells you that um, since this is equivalent to P uh, X I hat plus P Y J hat. So this tells you that, all right, so then X component of the momentum is just nine, nine kilogram or nine I hat kilogram meter per second, and that the Y component is negative 12 J hat kilograms meters per second. Okay, so those are the X and Y components of the momentum. Next part B, which is find the magnitude and direction. Well, I'm, 
I'm hoping that at this point, you know how to find magnitude and direction for a vector if you're given the components, which is the same thing for here as well. So here's the momentum, which is equals to its X component square plus Y component square. So then this is uh, nine square plus negative 12 square. So 15 kilograms meter per second as the magnitude. And magnitude can never be negative. Magnitude doesn't have a direction. It's just basically the strength. And then the direction given in terms of angle theta, which is inverse tangent of the Y component, negative 12 over the X component of nine. We calculate this. Um, so we should then um, get a negative number, right? So you should, you should technically get a negative um, 53 degrees. And then subtracting this from 360, you should get 307 degrees. Okay. So this should be your um, answer for the, because you can see, right? It was in the fourth quadrant, positive X, negative Y, it was in the fourth quadrant. So the angle should be somewhere in the fourth quadrant. All right, so that's kind of what we get. All right. So um, going back to the Newton's second law, that was net force equals uh, change in momentum over, over time, right? dp dt, the rate at which you change your momentum. Thing like this. Now we do what we do, we cross multiply both sides by dt. So we move dt over here. And we can like switch the sides and you end up basically dp equals uh, net force times dt. Okay, so this is written in, in you know, the reason for, for us written like this, because then from here we can take then the integral of both sides. On the left side, this is the integral of dp going from p initial to p final, which is going to give us nothing but delta p. On the right side, then what we end up with is you know, if we, inter, you know, do the derivative, in, so integrate. So this is gonna be then from T initial to T final. Okay, so you can write integrating to find the change in momentum over some time interval. So then Delta P, you should you know, not forget that. So Delta P, which is P final minus P initial equals to the integral of net force times DT with the limits of T initial to T final. Now this left side of the, uh, the right side of the equation, which is the integral of, you know, net force times dt. This is known as the impulse. So we call this impulse. And it is given with the capital I. Some books actually use capital J for that. So if you're using a different book, you know, just be careful with that. So an impulse is defined basically, thing like this, physically speaking, it's defined like this. So let's say you have an object moving towards the wall with some velocity. When it hits the wall, when it hits the wall, the wall exerts a force. And that force, let's say gonna be here in this direction. So this is that net force, let's say, acting on the, on the object. During, you know, because it collides with the wall and there's a force acting on it. But this force is not instantaneous. It takes some DT time for the force to act on the object. And that's what that DT represents. The time for collision and obviously after that, the ball gonna be, you know, uh, rebounding and moving to the left with some final velocity. And the force is basically written here, right? That's the force. And dt is the time of collision. Not the time of the object moving from right, uh, left to right or from right to left. This dt is how long was the force acting on the object? Basically force during the collision. So that's why this dt for this impulse most of the time is very small. So it could be like barely any few seconds or maybe like, let's say, um, could be microseconds or milliseconds and things like that. So you have to be, you know, understanding that this force is only during the time that, uh, sorry, so this impulse, right? The time in for the impulse, right? Is only during when the collision occurred, okay? So now um, let me show you also this, this equation, can be simplified, let's say, if the force is constant. If you know the force is constant, then I can remove that from the integral. And I have just the T initial, T final, just DT, 
and that's just nothing but delta t. That means it becomes net force times delta t. If I if I know my force is constant, then impulse is equal to just force times delta t or net force times delta t. Very straightforward. But if the force is not constant, then I can just basically, and that means it changes with time, I can then integrate and get that. Anyways, the you know, starting from this equation, right? Starting from this, this equation, we separated sides. So the left side, we have change in momentum. The right side, we have this integral, which basically we define to be the impulse. Then what we have, we have an impulse momentum theorem, which means the impulse of the force acting on the particle equals the change in the momentum of the particle. That means delta P equals the impulse. Again, impulse is not a force. You know, it's an impulse of the force. That means force acting during that short period of time. Okay. So this is basically, you can say this equivalent to Newton's second law, you know, more or less, putting it like that. All right. So one of the things we can do, we can see that I can rewrite this like delta P equals impulse. P final minus P initial equals impulse. And then P final is equals to P initial plus the impulse. Well, things like this. If I'm looking at this equation, the left side is momentum, which is kilograms, meters per second. The right side is basically impulse, which was defined as force times time, which is Newton's times seconds. Well, that means this is also equivalent to kilograms times meters per second. That means, you know, I can also write this, I can say this is equivalent to kilograms meter times seconds. Why is that the case? Well, remember, Newton is what? Newton is equivalent to kilograms meter per second square, then times seconds. So then the seconds cancels that, and you end up with that. So that's why they are equivalent. So that's, that means they have the same units. So in a way, then what you have is this. See, final momentum equals initial momentum plus impulse force. And this is an impulse force due to some external force. So you can see, right, if this is zero, then momentum doesn't change before and after. But if the impulse is not zero, then your momentum changes. You can have a momentum change due to the, let's say you have a, you have a box, right? So let's say you have a box moving to the right. Well, think like this. This is in terms of the initial momentum, which is M times V initial. All right, so then the final momentum will be based on this impulse force. So see, impulse force is positive if you apply force in the same direction. So then your final momentum basically, you know, increases in the same direction. But you can also have a negative impulse force if you're acting force in the opposite direction. So for example, friction can be a negative impulse force, right? So, uh, and you know, change your momentum such that, you know, if the impulse force is equivalent to the momentum, right? Then, you know, let's say you can get zero, which object stops. Right? So imagine if you're moving to the right and there's a friction, which acting you know, as a negative impulse, well, and it's equal to your initial momentum value, well, some later time you stop. So if your final velocity is zero, that means impulse is equal to your initial momentum and you end up with zero momentum at the end. Okay, did your momentum change? Of course, you went from non-zero to a zero momentum. And it was the reason, it was the reason, well, this, let's say could be like, let's say friction force, right? That removed all that. We're not talking about energy anymore, right? But basically it applied negative impulse, which, you know, change your momentum. All right, so basically an impulse given to the particle means that the momentum is transferred from an external agent to the particle. The equation Delta P equals I is called the conservation of momentum equation. Okay, so <clears throat> conservation of momentum is again, very important uh, and it's gonna be used quite a lot. Um, maybe not for, for uh, like, let's say for uh, life science major students, right? You guys are probably not gonna take more physics classes, but any, you know, let's say physical science, engineering or chemistry or thing like that, you guys are actually gonna be using momentum uh, you know, in future, right, for other, in, in, in other classes, even if it's not necessarily uh, physics, uh, because momentum concept is very important. All right, so you can see, right, the left side of the equation represents the change in momentum. The right side is a measure of how much momentum crosses the boundary of the system due to the net force being applied. Okay, so that's why this is known as the, 
you know, conservation of momentum equation. So in a way you can say that if the impulse is due to internal forces, then momentum is, can be conserved. If the impulse due to, due to external forces, then you don't have a change in momentum of an object of a particle, but you can in a way have system of particles when the momentum will still be conserved. All right, so let's explore the impulse a little bit more. So as I mentioned, if the force is constant, or you can, let, let's say you can average it out, it can come out of the integral and you have end up with the, the simple, you know, net force times delta T, either net or, or the net force average times delta T. Okay. So, but still, let's say, even if you have a, a integral, right? So let's say if you plot net force as a function of time, so let's say you get a graph like this, right? So you're getting a graph like that, um, the dark orange graph. Well, one of the things we can do here is this. So mathematically speaking, remember, if impulse is equals to integral of net force dt, that means the impulse is the equals to the area, right? Under the graph, of course, versus time. Impulse equals area under the graph. Well, obviously it's not easy to get the area of that particular, you know, curve, but we can, you know, simplify and say that area under this graph is equivalent to area under that graph, which is, you know, we can kind of like find the average force and use that for this particular, you know, replace the you know, first graph with the second one. The areas are equal. Now, how do we do that? Well, it will require generally to know the maximum force because this means that this is when the collision occurs and the force is not, let's say constant, but it's a variable. You can see, right? So like, let's say, a, you know, at initial time force, you know, basically starts acting on the object because here's the thing. Imagine if you have um, an object, right? Moving toward the wall, any object, for example, tennis ball, tennis ball, when it hits the wall, it hits the wall, let's say the instant, when it hits the wall, there's a force acting on it, let's say in this direction. Well, the object, you know, for example, like a tennis ball, right, is an elastic object, which means that it doesn't just, you know, bounce back, it starts compressing. And when it starts compressing, right, so it starts compressing like this, a little bit like that, right? During that, the force then starts increasing force starts increasing on the object. And that's what this graph represents. See, this is the increasing force until it reaches some F max. So this is like F max. And then the ball starts re-expanding and moving to the right. That means the force then basically decreases and goes to zero. And this is where the contact stops. So then the ball now is moving away from the wall. Okay. And one of the things we can do if you know the maximum force then average force is exactly half, half of that. So that, that means, you know, a, a thing like this. If you have the maximum force divided by two, then gives you then the average force. Half of the maximum force is equivalent to then the average. So that's why you can see, right? If this is the max, then you do the average. And average means that you can make, assume that during the entire time, there was a constant average force. And we know how to get the area under this graph, which is simple, right? Um, base times height and, you know, very simply, we can calculate that. And we can we can do that because um, average force is always gonna be half of the maximum. And if you have the maximum, you can always replace that with the average. And it's always easier with working with average because the area under the graph is easier in that case. All right, so impulse approximation, assume that one of the forces exerted on the particle acts for a short time, but is much greater than um, any other force present. This force is called the impulse force. Again, when we call impulse force is not really a force. So when you talk about impulse, right? Impulse is basically due to some impulse force. Impulse force is the one that changes the momentum of the object, let's say, acting on the object during that short period of time. All right, so let's look at an example. Three kilogram steel ball strikes a wall with a speed of 10 meter per second at an angle of 60 degree with the surface. So this is 60 degrees. It bounces off with the same speed and same angle. That means let's say this is 10 meters per second 
This is also 10 meters per second. And this is also 60 degrees. All right, so if the ball is in contact with the wall for 0.2 seconds, which is 200 milliseconds, right? What is the average force exerted by the wall on the ball? All right, so the question is this. Sometimes I have students asking me, all right, so, but it doesn't seem like the momentum has changed because the speed and the direction is the same, but not quite, not quite. So you can see, right, the direction actually does change for at least one of the components. So look at this. I take this and break it down into, so let's, let's call this V initial. So this will be then V initial X, then this will be initial Y, right? That's the, mom, the velocity components. So if I'm looking at, remember, momentum is what? Momentum here is mass times velocity initial, which will be mass times V initial X I hat plus V initial Y J hat. Now let's look at the final momentum. And if I break it down into components, I get this V final X and I get that V, initial, uh, v final Y. Then final momentum is M times V final, which is M times, and this will be V final X negative I hat, right? To the left, plus V final Y J hat. Okay. Now you can see that at least one component changes direction, which is the X component. Vertical component doesn't, but the horizontal component changes direction. So then that's you know what we're gonna be exploring, right? So because that's kind of what we have. So one thing we can do here is uh, we can understand that I can look at it in terms of this, P final and P final. So remember X component uh, is gonna be then let's say V times cosine theta. Y component is gonna be then V times sine of theta. Um, well, may, maybe not, uh, not for this particular one because theta is given with respect to that. So I guess it's other way around. So um, this is sine of theta, this is cosine of theta. <clears throat> And we can calculate that, right? So uh, we can calculate this in terms of, uh, let's say P final uh, is equals to mass times then uh, negative 10 sine of 60 I had plus uh, 10 cosine of 60 J hat. Okay, so get that. And um, P initial, all right, so the mass was, let me put here as three kilograms. Okay, so then it will be, so three times, so it's 30 sine 60. So then this will be, let's say 26 uh, I hat minus 26 I hat plus 30 cosine 60, uh, 15 J hat. P initial then three kilograms times, you know, uh, basically uh, same thing, but 25 oh, sorry. is then 10 sine of 60 I hat plus 10 cosine 60 J hat, right? So this is then 26 I hat uh, plus 15 J hat. Now, when we do then P final minus P initial, change in momentum, then this will be uh, basically P final is negative 26 I hat plus 15 J hat, then minus 26 I hat plus 15 J hat, okay? Which means I can just add them together, which is gonna give me equals to so negative 26 I hat minus 26 I hat, then plus 15 J hat minus 15, or in, in a way what I'm doing here is I'm factoring out, let's say uh, I hat, right? Then plus 15 minus 15 J hat, something like that. And you can see, right, this goes zero, 
and this one here is negative 52 i hat that means negative 52 i hat uh, kilograms meters per second that's my delta p negative 52 i hat kilogram meter per second again that's because in a y direction there was no change in momentum but in the x direction there was and my change in momentum is basically pretty much in represented in terms of the x direction then we are told that there is a force acting on it for 0.2 seconds and it's an average force it's asking and we know that delta p is equals to impulse which is equals to some average force times delta t so then I can just divide both sides by delta t to solve for the f average okay which means um, negative 52 divided by 0 0.2 All right, so 52 divided by 0.2. So then F average is then 260 minus 260 Newtons I had, which means the force that was acting on it was 260 Newton strength, right? And negative I had direction, which, which should make sense because if you think about the force, when it hits the wall, right? When it's here, hits the wall, the force will be like this in this direction. Okay, so this will be that average force. All right, so that's for this example. Now we're gonna talk about then collisions. So you can see, right, we, we use the term collision um, to represent an event during which two particles come close to each other and interact by mean of forces. All right, so basically two objects basically colliding, okay. So think like this here, you know, object one moving with some initial velocity. Here, object two moving with some initial velocity. So D1 initial, D2 initial, and they move towards each other until they collide. So let's say this, is, this will be before. And then, you know, during the collision, they collide with one another. Okay. During the collision, they collide and they exert force on one another. So this is during, and then after that you have after the collision, which then the balls, one moves with one final velocity to the to the right to the left, the other one moves with final velocity to the right. So moving, colliding, and bouncing off. And I'm going to take the system to be including those two particles, and I'm going to assume that there is no friction or you know everything is negligible. So then the time interval during which the velocity changes from its initial value to final value is assumed to be very short, which is basically during the collision, right? When the velocity changes, remember, from to the right to the left or to the left to, to the right, um, it happens very quickly only during the collision. It doesn't take, it's not instantaneous, but it doesn't take that long of time. So, and um, that's what most of the time during the collision, right? The time delta T, is the time of the collision and it's usually very short. Okay, so then the interaction force is assumed to be much greater than any external forces. What is the interaction force? Here's the force during the collision when they exert force on one another. So remember what I have here is this, this is the force that two exerts on one and this is the force that one exerts on two. And those forces, right? Those forces that they exert on one another during the collision are actually interaction force and interaction force is action reaction force okay and this means that impulse approximation can be used which means that we can say that during the collision right during the collision the forces are action reaction forces and only internal forces because i'm closing isolating my system from environment okay and then after that they basically individually change the momentum but still you know what i have here this i have a system of momentum and we're going to see this becomes you know very important factor uh for that okay because the impulse approximation remember is what the delta p is equals to impulse well impulse is due to some external forces and there are no external forces only internal forces that means this is zero 
Well, if this is zero, that means delta p equals zero. Well, delta p equals zero means that delta p is constant. What does it mean? Conservation of momentum. That means momentum of the system before is equal to the momentum of the system after. And that's basically the conservation of momentum, which we'll see in, in this, you know, uh, for these collisions. So the collisions may be a result of physical contact, two objects actually, you know, colliding like this. And you can see, right, those are the forces they exert on one another. And those are action reaction internal forces. So that's why they are not part of the, I mean, if I'm talking about like impulse, so this is my net force times delta T, but this is an F12 minus F21 times delta T, but those are action reaction forces. That means they're equal in magnitude, opposite direction. So the sum gives you zero. That's why impulse is zero because force uh, forces are internal and all the internal forces always cancel each other. So the impulsive force may vary within time in a complicated ways. This force is internal to the system and the momentum is conserved, okay? So collision can occur for particles that were never in contact as well. So for example, you can also have some uh, long distance interaction forces, gravity uh, or um, electric forces, magnetic forces and things like that, right? So, uh, so those are, for example, those are electric forces between those two particles. We're gonna learn all about that in physics 67. But you can have actual contact force or, you know, interactive like wrong ledge forces, but still, as long as there are, uh, let's say, um, action reaction pairs, right? They are considered internal and electric forces are action reaction. They exert force on one another, uh, same magnitude, opposite direction. And you can assume that you know, those are internal forces and they can conserve the momentum, okay? Now, we're gonna break down collisions into two categories. So now that we're talking about collisions, there are actually two types of collisions. One is an elastic collision, okay? Elastic collision, yeah, it has two important, you know, parts to that. There is a conservation of momentum and conservation of kinetic energy. That means if you're talking about elastic collisions, momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. Okay, so again, right there's a perfectly elastic collisions occur on microscopic level. That means like particles, electrons and protons and things like that. And the microscopic collisions, like, you know, two cars colliding or two billiard balls colliding and things like that, only approximately elastic collisions actually occur. Okay, but you know, important thing about elastic collisions is that momentum is conserved and kinetic energy is conserved. And then we have inelastic collisions. So you can like elastic and inelastic. For the inelastic collisions, momentum is conserved, but kinetic energy is not conserved. That means during the collision, some of the energy can be dissipated as heat, where that doesn't occur in elastic collisions. Anyways. That means, for example, if you have two objects moving toward each other, and uh, let's say object one, V1 initial, object two, V2 initial, then they collide, and then they move after the collision with some, you know, V1 final, V2 final. So we have before collision, during the collision, and then after the collision. Now, momentum, so let's say if it's elastic, and compared to like, let's say inelastic. So if you have something like this, if you have this scenario, momentum is the same. So P initial equals to P final for the system. P initial equals to P final for the system for both type of collisions. If I look at this, I'm actually not gonna be able to tell if it's elastic or not. Is it elastic or is it inelastic? I don't know. Momentum is concerned for both of them. Then how do we know? Well, I, ca I calculate kinetic energy of the system before, calculate kinetic energy of the system after. If they're equal to one another, then this is an elastic collision. If I calculate kinetic energy before and after, and I compare them, and final kinetic energy is less than initial kinetic energy, then it's an inelastic collision. I right away know that after doing this calculation, Without doing this calculation, I wouldn't know for this type of problem 
you know, after, you know, let's say two objects move toward each other, they collide and bounce back like that. I wouldn't know if it's elastic or inelastic, you know, until I calculate the kinetic energy before and after. So that's how you would know if it's elastic or inelastic. Unless, unless there's a very specific case where if the objects stick together after the collision, right? If they stick together after the collision, then I definitely know it's a inelastic collision. Imagine, for example, if you have two objects like that, they're moving toward each other, then they collide, but then they stick together and move as one with one final velocity. Then I definitely know it's an inelastic collision. Okay, only for the inelastic collisions, objects would stick together. So this is known as a perfectly inelastic collision. So perfectly inelastic is when they stick together. And you definitely know there is gonna be conservation of momentum but not conservation of kinetic energy. That means the system gonna lose kinetic energy because during that time when they fuse together, right? When they stick together, some of their kinetic energy is gone into heat, okay? So and you can calculate, let's say, how much of that energy was gone to heat and things like that. So in an inelastic collision, some kinetic energy is lost, but the objects do not stick together. What does it mean? Well, it means that not every inelastic collisions, they stick together only during the perfectly inelastic collisions. They could be collisions, like I showed you in the first example right here, where they you know, strike each other and they bounce back without sticking together. But if the kinetic energy is still lasts in the system before and after, it's still inelastic collision. Only in some cases they stick together. But whenever they do stick together, you definitely know it's an inelastic collision. So again, we call it perfectly inelastic. For the perfectly elastic, it usually happens at the microscopic level, like electrons and protons and things like that. All right. Hopefully this will allow you to kind of get a little bit of better understanding of this. Um, we'll, we'll do some examples and you guys can see you know, how we can use all of those. But the idea is this, momentum is conserved in all collisions, regardless if it's elastic or inelastic, perfectly elastic or perfectly inelastic, momentum is always conserved. All right, so now let's look at this perfectly inelastic one more time. Remember, this is when they stick together after the collision. So imagine this is before. And a lot of times what we're gonna do here is because during the collision, the forces are internal, we can completely remove that from the, from the equation. So we don't really need to look at this anymore because if we know that we're gonna be colliding and the external forces are zero, we can just look at before and after like we did for the energy approach. So this is before and this is after. And I know if the momentum is conserved, I can say then P initial equals to P final. Now, what is the P initial? Well, it's a P one initial. So in initial momentum of object one plus initial momentum of object two. And this is then equal to the momentum of the system, like P final of one plus P final of two. So let's look at this a little bit later, right? So let's look at what I'm doing here. P initial equals P final. This is the equation for the conservation of momentum. Like that, conservation of momentum. What it means is that momentum of the system before equals momentum of the system after. How do I write this? Well, remember, momentum is mass, right? So P1 initial is M1 V1 initial plus then M2 V2 initial. This is the momentum of the system before collision. Momentum of the system after collision, then M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. This is then momentum of the system after the collision. So in a way, this is the general equation. This is the general equation for the conservation of momentum, which is with the system of two particles. All right now, if you have this particular case where the collision is perfectly inelastic, so you have object M1 V1 initial, object M2 V2 initial. So this is my energy, you know, momentum of the system before collision, right? Just like I have here, M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial, because each one has a you know, momentum to start with. Remember the V2 initial here will end up being negative because object is moving to the left. So in the equation where you write it like this, but then V2 initial can be like negative two 
meter per second I had. So then you have to make sure that it's negative rather than positive. But then after the collision, they stick together, which means that I can write them with combined mass of M1 plus M2, then times with one final velocity. Because they see here individually they have, you know, this is basically, let's say when they bounce back with different final velocities. But if they don't, if they stick together, then my you know, right side of the equation becomes that, my final momentum of the system, which is becomes one blob, right? With the combined mass of M1 plus M2, and then there's just one final velocity. Okay. So then this is then the equation for the perfectly inelastic collision, specifically for perfectly inelastic. Then I can use this by dividing both sides by M1 plus M2 to solve for the final velocity, which is this equation here. That means it's a probably the simplest collision when they, they stick, because when they stick together, you know it's a inelastic collision right away. And if they stick together, that means they have one mass after the collision and one velocity after the collision, relatively much simpler than anything else. So usually when we talk about elastic collisions, they can be relatively tedious and complicated to work with. Inelastic collision, specific, specifically perfectly inelastic, is much, much simpler than anything else. All right. So let's look at them perfectly elastic. And this is example when you have two objects moving toward each other with some initial velocity. And then they strike each other, but remember, they're never gonna stick together, right? So perfectly, you know, perfectly or just elastic, doesn't matter, just elastic or perfectly elastic. They're not gonna stick together. So they're gonna, you know, move with some final velocity. We have two equations. This is then the conservation of momentum, which I just showed you in the previous slide. Let's say this is equation one, where, you know, this is the moment on the left side, you have a momentum of the system before collision. On the right side, you have a momentum of the system after the collision. But also we know that for the elastic collision, there's also conservation of, um, you know, energy, kinetic energy. That means this is the kinetic energy of the system before collision. That means kinetic energy of each one added together. And remember here, velocity is not, you know, a vector. It's it, V is a speed. So you don't have any negatives over there. And then this is kinetic energy of the system after the collision. And if, you know, each one has a speed, then you basically calculate the kinetic energy and add them together. And they equal to one another, not individually, but as a, as a system energy before and after is exactly the same. That means if I calculate this to be 100 joules, well, this one also will be 100 joules, 100%. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, what we get for this particular one. All right, so how, then do, how, how do we then find the final speed or final velocity of each one after the collision? Let's say if you're not given those. But remember, in a way we have this, right? You have equation one and we have equation two. So if I give you initial velocities, and if I give you final velocity, uh, sorry, initial velocity of object one, and initial velocity of object two, and M1 and M2, and the only thing I'm asking is final velocity of one and final velocity of two, should be a piece of cake, right? Because you have two equations. Well, actually not quite so. Working with those two equations is extremely difficult and tedious. So look at the equation that we get for the you know expression for v1 final and v2 final by combining those two equations, doing bunch of substitution and things like that. Here's what we get. And believe me, it will take you hours to derive those equations. So it's extremely tedious, extremely tedious. But in a way, here's the equation. So you can write it down in your formula sheet. And if you have two objects in an elastic collision with initial velocity moving toward each other, right? Or moving like, let's say, you can have one moving like this faster than the other one, that they're still gonna collide elastically, right? So you can have something like that, but which means that they both have an initial velocity. But here's the thing, those two, let's say equation three gives you V1 final, equation four gives you V2 final, their speed or their velocity after the collision, assuming that there was initial velocity for each one, okay. What we do generally is when we make a simple modification, for example, let's say we're gonna look at an example where 
object two is at rest. So things like this. We have this. Here's object two. I'm talking about this one over here. So let's say we have object two that initially v1 final uh, v2 sorry v2 initially is at you know zero. This is going to make our equation a little bit simpler. See if v2 initially is zero, that means you have object one moving toward the second one, which is at rest. See if v2 initial is zero, v2 initial is zero, this entire thing goes to zero, this entire thing goes to zero. And then our equation three simplifies into just a you know, little bit simpler expression for v1 final. And our equation four simplifies a little bit simpler into v2 final. And that's what we're gonna do. You can see, right? So if I take the object two to be initially at rest, then expression three and four simplifies quite a bit. And that's what we have. For elastic collisions in one dimension, particle two initially at rest, then you get end up with those two simpler expressions. Again, derivation of those are tedious, so I don't recommend. But um, let's say you know, I don't recommend to try to do that on the exam or something like that. So you already given the equations. You just need to know when to apply that. Those are two equations only for the elastic collisions, only when object two is initially at rest. This is when you do that. This is when you use these equations, right? V1 final, V2 final using this equation three, let's say in four, right? Only when you have an elastic collision and you know you have elastic collision and then you know that object two initially at rest, then you can use this equation and it becomes very simple, straightforward calculations. All right, so we're talking about quite a lot about collisions, but you know, in any ways, I think collisions are relatively straightforward if you kind of practice a little bit and understand, let's say, you know, the, the, the concept behind that. So you could see, right, I did a lot of graphs and things like that. I, I did a lot of, you know, like simple pictures, sketches and things like that. That actually helps quite a lot. So always draw a simple diagram of the particles before and after collision, include the appropriate velocity vectors and things like that. So that's why if I do something like this, V1 initial and something like that, V2 initial, it's simple, but what does it, what does it tell me? Well, it tells me that V2 initial has to be negative I hat, right? And if I, you know, if I miss that, my entire calculation is wrong. But if I have a picture in front of me, it's easier for me to see that, to verify that. So that's why, you know, it's important to do those sketches. Now, is the system of particles isolated? Right, so that, that's gonna be then another question. So if so, categorize the collision as elastic, inelastic, or perfectly inelastic. That means, are you talking about with the object moving and colliding with the wall and then bouncing back? That system is not isolated because wall is an external force acting on it. Uh, but do you have, let's say, two particles colliding on a frictionless surface? Then yes, it's an isolated system and you can do elastic and elastic or perfectly inelastic collision. So you have to kind of understand. It's never, uh, you know, the momentum is never conserved if you're dealing with just a simple single particle. Single particle, every time any force acting on it is external force, which will change its momentum. If you have two particles, when they interact, the force between them is internal. And if you isolate the system, then it can be pretty much conservation of momentum. You have to be careful there. And analyze, set up the appropriate mathematical representation. Right, so you can see right here, here's what you have to be careful, right? If the collision is perfectly inelastic. All right, so the question is, when is it perfectly inelastic? Well, when they stick together, remember, right? When they stick together. So then this equation, this is the equation when they stick together and you know that it's a perfectly inelastic. If the collision is elastic, then you have uh, two equations actually three equations in a way. So equation one is this. Equation two, I showed you, that's basically kinetic energy of the system before equals kinetic energy of the system after. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy equation. There's also the third equation, which can be you know, quite useful too. And this equation kind of puts together, combines together into a, just a velocity equations. V1 initial minus V2 initial equals negative of V1 final minus V2 final. So remember, you have also this equation if you know the co collision is elastic. If it's elastic, you also can use this equation to solve for the, you know, V1 initial, V2, uh, v v V1 final, V2 final, or depending what it's asking. So you also have those three equations plus those equations that I showed you uh, in the previous slide. 
All right, so if the collision is inelastic, but not perfectly, just inelastic, then you have this equation that you have to work with. Because how do I know, again, how do I know if it's inelastic, kinetic energy before and after, not equal to one another, and they don't stick together. It's just an inelastic collision, but not a perfectly inelastic, okay? So this is also true for the perfectly inelastic. The only difference, they stick together for the perfectly inelastic. But again, inelastic collision, you know, you have a special case where they stick together, but not always. Okay. Finalize, you have once determined your result, check to see if your answers are consistent with the mental and pictorial representation and what your results are realistic. So, yeah, so for example, if you're talking about the, the velocity of a car or something like that after the collision, if you get, let's say, I don't know, a thousands of meters per second, that's definitely gonna be wrong. If you get like say centimeters per second, probably again gonna be wrong, right? Try to be, you know, be understanding that car, let's say, for example, maybe moves at few, uh, let's say, you know, 10, 20, 30 meters per second. So before and after collision, is it consistent with what you kind of expect? All right, so let's look at, you know, a couple of examples then. You have a railroad car of mass 2.5 times 10 to the 4 kilogram is moving with a speed of 4 meter per second. It collides and couples with three other coupled railroad cars, each of the same mass as the single car and moving in the same direction with an initial speed of then two meters per second. So the question is, what type of collision is this? Well, it doesn't tell you that they stick together, but they tell you that they couples, right? Which is another you know, way of telling you that they basically stick together. So it's a perfectly inelastic collision. Then what is the speed of the four cars after the collision? Because perfectly inelastic means that they're gonna stick together and move as one after the collision. So we can find that. And how much of the mechanical energy is lost in the collision? All right, so we can then look at this example as uh, sort of like a system of, you know, of particles, right? So um, because it's a perfectly inelastic, momentum is conserved. So I can say P initial is equals to P final, okay? All right, so what I have here is then um, I have object one with uh, two point four. Technically I can, I have this, right? So I have M1 equals M2 equals M3 equals M4. So equals some M, right? That means, you know, basically I have, um, all of them have the same mass. So I can say, all right, here's my object one. I can just make it as sort of like a particle with mass M moving with some initial velocity. And this is basically four meters per second, V1 initial. My object two is then collection of then uh, three tracks together, right? Three railroad cars with a total mass of three M. And they are moving with the initial velocity of uh, two meters per second. So this is before the collision. So then I can say my P initial is equals to uh, M times uh, V1 initial plus three M times V2 initial. Okay. Then my final momentum is that they couple together one, two, three, four. So four M with moving with some final velocity, which we don't know and we're trying to find. That means my final momentum will be then 4m, right, times v final. And since initial and final momentum are the same, that means those are equal to one another. That means I can say 3m times v initial, v1 initial, like this, right, plus 3m times v2 initial is equal to 4m times v final. I can do that. Like this is momentum before, this is momentum after, and they equal to one another. Well, here I can simply do this, right? So I can say, all right. Um, they all have the same mass. So I can drop the mass. And I can switch the side. So it becomes 4v final equals v1 initial plus 3 times V2 initial, and I divide both sides by four, right, to get my calculation. So this is four meters per second 
for the V1 initial plus three times two meters per second for the V2 initial, and this is divided by four. So then my V final is equals to 2.5 meters per second. That's the velocity. See, it's in positive, it means moving to the right. All right, so this was part A. Part B says, how much mechanical energy is lost in the collision? And we know that it is lost, right? So part B just means that, let's say one thing you can do is, you know, independently find K initial, then find K final, and then subtract them. For example, K initial is equals to what? Is K1 initial plus K2 initial, because both one and two had, in, you know, initial kinetic energy. So this would be one half M1 V1 initial square plus one half M2 V2 initial square. How about K final? K final is in one half, uh, or thing like this. If I do this, it's gonna be just, you know, in terms of uh, M, and this will be in terms of then three M, right? That's my mass. And then final is then one half times four M times V final square, which we just calculated. To find how much energy was lost, then what I can do here is I can, I can subtract them. So then K final minus K initial, right? So whatever I calculate here, whatever I calculate there, just basically their difference. You can just plug in and calculate. And one thing you will always get for inelastic collision is you're gonna get a negative number because final energy always less than initial energy, kinetic energy, right? So here we're gonna get negative 3.75 times 10 to the four joules. Why? Because energy was lost. And that's the amount of energy that was lost, okay? So sometimes it might ask you in terms of percentage. So then what you can do, you can do K final minus K initial divided by K initial times 100%. So you can find, let's say that in terms of percentage, how, what is the percentage of the energy that was lost or how much energy is left or something like that. So you can kind of use that, you know, to find out. All right, here's one more example. Two blocks are free to slide along the frictionless wooden track as shown. The block of mass M1 is five equals five kilogram is released from position shown, which is basically, let's call this point A. And let's call this point B where the block B is sitting. So um, where it is, it, you, know, you know, point A is basically has a height of five meter above the flat part of the track. Protruding from its front end is the north pole of a strong magnet. Okay, that means they both have magnets, okay? Um, which then repels the north pole of an identical magnet embedded in the back of the black, which is in a way thing like this. So when M1 is released, it's gonna go down, reach point B, hit, you know, M2, but instead of actually physically hitting each other, they're gonna interact due to magnetic forces, but it's exactly the same, would have been same as if they actually hit each other. So because magnetic forces, so this one is, you know, it has, um, it has a north and it's gonna interact and be repelled by the north of the second one. Because in, magne in magnets, right, you have a south pole and north pole. You put with another north and south, north and north, they're gonna repel each other which is same as like they actually physically striking each other, which, uh, you know, that is interesting to, you know, have this example here because you still have, a, you know, forces interacting, you know, the interacting forces, right? It's just not a contact force, but a magnetic force, long range force. But still imagine what happens is that M1 goes down, hits M2 and it bounced back because of that force from M2. All right, so, um, all right, so which repels the North Pole of an identical magnet embedded in the back end of the block of mass M2 equals 10 kilogram, which is initially at rest. The two blocks never touch. Calculate the maximum height to which M1 rises after the elastic collision. All right, good to know, right? Elastic collision. All right, so let's see what we have. This example combines two things that we have learned already. It's gonna combine um, some conservation of energy for, for example, for, for object M1. Because, you know, going from point, one, point A to point B, if I separate this, this is nothing but the conservation of mechanical energy. M1 going down the, along a frictionless surface, 
and I want to know what is the speed of M1 at point B. And I can find that by using the you know, conservation of mechanical energy. So think like this. So this is my system one. System one is basically this. I want to find what is the speed of M1 when it reaches M2, because that's the speed it's going to have when it strikes or interacts with M2. And to find it, I can say, all right, so the, along the entire time, the gravity only force acting on it, mechanical energy is conserved. So I can say kinetic energy at point A plus gravitational potential at point A equals kinetic energy at point B plus gravitational at, at potential energy at point B. I'm going to take the point B to be along the, my uh, you know, reference. So y equals zero on that line. And if I do that, that means there is no gravitational potential there. And since block one, M1 starts from rest, that means it also has no kinetic energy, which means all I have is this, M1 times G times H, right? For, for that height is equal to then one half M1 times speed one square which is basically at point B, right? Uh, canceling the mass, then I can rewrite this where VB, right? V1B is equal to then square root of two GH. So this should be already simple enough for you guys. So two times 9.8 times, when we are given is just five meter height, since it's only five meter above, I can use this to calculate that this is 9.9 .9 meter per second. That means this is the speed that black M1 will have when it starts interacting. That, that means before the collision with M2, because we need that, right? We need to know that. Because after that, it's an elastic collision. So let's so now, now this is a collision, which is here. I'm going to look at, you know, in terms of system two, which is after the collision, you know, basically like a collision. What happens here is this. I'm gonna have M1 have a mass of five kilograms, M2 that has a mass of 10 kilograms. Now V1 initial before the collision gonna be then 9.9 .9 meter per second, which we just calculated. And then V2 initial is zero because object two is at rest. Okay. And then we just learned, right? If I have this conditions, right? Then I can use those set of equations that we just learned. And my goal here is this. It says calculate after, after they interact, right? Calculate the maximum height in which M1 rises after the elastic collision. Because after it collides, then the velocity it's gonna have after the collision gonna allow it to, to go some height H, you know, back along that, you know, incline. That means my goal is to find V1 final. And I don't really care about then V2 final. I don't care what happens to object two. I need to know what happens to object one so then I can see how high it can go afterwards. Which means I can, you know, I need to get basically the, you know, a V1 final, which is given in the equation, right? So in the equation that we, we just, you know, looked at, which is M1 minus M2 divided by M1 plus M2 times V1 initial. Remember, if I have this equation, then I can basically do that. And I have V1 initial, I have M1 and M2 and everything, right? If I just plug in everything into this, um, then I can calculate that to be negative 3.3 meters per second. I believe you can just plug in the values of masses and velocity and calculate this number. So negative 3.3 meters per second. Why is it negative? That means, you know, black M1 gonna be then, then moving to the left, right? After the collision and then go up along the incline. That means at point B, now it has a velocity 3.3 meter per second, but to the left. What's gonna happen afterwards? Well, it's gonna start going up the incline with 3.3 meter per second velocity. And I can say, all right, so since the entire time then you're gonna have uh, gravity acting on it, we can see then how high it will go with initial speed like that. That means go to some point, I keep doing that. So going to some point C, let's say. So then I can say, all right, so then what I have here is this is point B. So now my black has some initial velocity at point, you know, let's say initial, right? B is initial and some point C is final. So how high it will go until it stops. 
and I can look at it in terms of that height. Okay. All right, so again, it's a conservation of mechanical energy because the gravity only thing is gonna acting on it. So I can say, right, you know, K, you know, KB plus UGB is equal to then KC plus UGC. Well, since I know that point B is still my reference, so there's no potential energy there. And my point C is the highest point it will reach until it stops. So there is no kinetic energy there. So then one half MVC square is equal to then, you know, um, sorry. Yeah, never mind. One half MVB squared, because it's the, you know, this is the only one survives. Um, and for the point C, I have then all the energy is converted into gravitational potential energy. So it's just M times G times this H maximum. Where's the maximum height it's gonna have. All right, so again, getting rid of the mass. And this time we're just solving for H max. So this is just basically one half times V B square over G. Okay, so plug in one half, then negative 3.3 .3 meter per sec square divided by 9.8. So we get 0.556 meters. All right, so remember it started from five meter above but then second time after the collision, only able to go up like half a meter because most of the energy uh, basically in a way was given, right? It's, 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 it's a conservation of energy, but you know, it was given to the black M2 because M2 after the collision will start moving. We don't care about that for this particular example, but it will be moving. And whatever energy the, the object one has left will allow it still go you know, above you know, the, the point B, right? Uh, about half a meter above that along the incline. But still, you know, it's basically only half a meter compared to five meter that it started with. But it's still, this is the way you know, to solve for this type of problem. All right, um, collisions can also be two dimensional, which means that, uh, for example, if this is not like a head on collision, but the collision where the object M2 is right here. So now imagine when it's collide, it's right here. So it's gonna make this guy go like that. And you know, the M1 will go move like that, like in this example. So then you have, you know, two dimensional collision. Okay. So for general collision of two dimension, right? Or three dimension, right? The total momentum of each direction is conserved. You can still have, you know, mo momentum is conserved for the individual collisions. So then we can say there's now two equations for conservation of momentum, one along the X, one along the Y. So then that means what I can do here is this. If I'm doing for this particular example, right? See before the collision, I can write it like this. So the X component becomes like this, M1, V1, initial X, plus M2, V2, initial X. But since M2 was at rest initially, this is zero. So then I can put that as zero. Then after the collision, well, after the collision, I have this object one moving with some final velocity. That means I only look at the X component to right over here. So it becomes M1 V1 final X, right? Which is, you know, nothing but M1 V1 final cosine of phi because V1 final is, uh, V1 final X is V1 final cosine theta or cosine phi, whatever. I think, you know, for this one, we use theta for one. And then this is plus then object two. Here's object two. It also has a final X component. So it becomes M2 V2 final cosine phi because each one has a final momentum after the collision and each one has a two dimensional final momentum. In the Y direction, I can say M1 V2 initial Y, sorry, M1 V1 initial Y the subscripts, right? Uh, M1, V1, initial Y, plus M2, V2, initial Y. And then in this case, I can see, right? Uh, if I look at before collision, M1 does not have a Y component. So this is zero. M2 doesn't have a Y component. It's not, not moving at all. So this is zero. So that's why it's zero plus zero. But after the collision, after the collision, object one has a vertical component of its velocity and after object two has a vertical component. So it becomes M1 V1 final sine of theta because its component, you know, 
is sine of theta, then minus, because it's negative for the two, right? So M2 V2 final sine of T. And you end up with this equation. And then you can just, you have two equations, you can you know, solve them, you, know, you can divide one over other and things like that, right? So there are a number of things we can do with this type of you know, equation, but this is the, sort of like the idea. That means you have all of those that you need to then work with this. Additionally, additionally, remember, so you have other equations, right? If this is elastic, if this is elastic, then you can also have, <coughs> uh, if equation is elastic, you also have this conservation of kinetic energy, which is object one as a kinetic energy before, but after that, both of them have kinetic energy. So, but their sum is still equal to one another. That means some of the kinetic energy of object one was given to the object two. So let's say object one has a hundred joules of kinetic energy to start with. Then, you know, some of it given to this, maybe 30, and this one still has 70. So for example, but the sum before and after is still exactly the same. All right, so let's look at this example here. Okay. Two automobiles of equal mass approach an intersection. One vehicle is traveling with the speed of 13 meter per second toward the east, and the other one is traveling north with the speed of V2 initial. So we're not given. Neither driver sees the other. The vehicles collide in the intersection um, and stick together, leaving parallel skid marks at an angle of 55 degrees. So this eight should be just a degrees north of east. The speed limit for both roads is 35 miles per hour and the driver of the northward bound moving vehicle, this guy over here, claims he was within the speed limit when the collision occurred. Is he telling the truth? Explain your reasoning. That means uh, we need to find the velocity because um, the velocity li speed limit is 35 miles an hour. And we want to find what is the initial velocity of object two. Then we can look at it in terms of uh, if he was within the speed limit or not, right? So, so that's kind of going to be, you know, our, uh, you know, in terms of concluding that. All right. So um, let's see. So we're given... In a way, I can I can draw another you know a coordinate system here, right? So you guys can see what's going on more or less. See, I have an object one here. So let's say this is you know m one, right? So moving with a velocity of thirteen meter per second, I had. So this is v one initial, and this is v two in you know v two initial. We don't know what it is, but it was moving. We know it's in a j head direction. Okay, when they collide. So they basically collide at, the, at, the, at this point, right? We, we say that they, they collide at the, at the origin and they're gonna be then moving with some V final here. And this is then 55 degrees. Okay. We don't know. We don't know what is the final velocity of them. We don't know that, um, but we're given the angle theta at which they're gonna be moving after the collision. All right, so let's see what we can do with that. Our goal is to find this guy here. All right, so what we do here is then this. I separate my conservation of momentum equation into two dimensions, right? So I say, all right, so it's M1 V1 initial X plus M2 V2 initial X equals, well, it's a, per, com, a, per, a completely or perfectly inelastic collision, which means they stick together. So it becomes M1 plus M2, and they are, they are of equal mass. So in a way I can drop all the subscripts, right? So like that, and I can just say this is equals to then 2m times v final x, v final x, right? That means I'm looking at the x component, right? So this is v final x, and this is v final y. I'm going to be using those in these equations. All right, I have that. And in the y direction, I have then m times v1 initial y plus m times v2 initial y equals then 2m v final in a y direction. Let's put it like this. Then I can simplify. So I wanted you guys to see this you know, entire equation, full set, and then we can simplify. See, object two has no x component initially. Object one has no y component initially. So those are zero. That means I can rewrite this equation like this modified in a y direction, I have then just this, right? Uh, 
you know, M, M times V2 initial Y equals two times M V final Y. But here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say this is V final sine of theta, right? V final sine of theta because V final Y is V final sine of theta. In the X direction, I'm gonna say this. Then this is for this one, right? So it's M times V1 initial X equals two M's and the V final X is gonna be written then as V final cosine of theta, right? So I end up with modified equation for the, I guess equation one and two. So those are the modified. Then what I do here, I divide them. I, you know, and one thing you can see that if when I divide, divide like this, right? Uh, mass cancels out here, 2m, 2m cancels out, even v final, v final cancels out. What do I end up with? I end up with v2 initial in the y direction divided by v1 initial in the x direction equals sine theta over cosine theta, which is tangent of theta. And remember, what did I want to, what did I need to find? V2 initial. That means V2 initial is equals to V1 initial X times tangent of theta. That's it. So if I calculate, this is 13 meters per second times tangent of 55 degrees, we get 18.6 meter per second. That's the velocity 18.6 meter per second for the car two. Now, what do we do? We, you know, since everything given into miles per hour, we convert this to miles per hour. So V2 initial is equal to 41.5 miles per hour. All right. So his claim that he was within the speed limit obviously was false. He was not being truthful because he was driving. So instead of 25 miles per hour, which was the speed limit, he was driving 41.5 miles per hour. And I guess you can say he was the reason that accident occurred in the first place. But anyway, so this is kind of how you would approach. That means you, you set up with an you know, equation set like that, one and two, and then simplify. A lot of times you can divide them to eliminate. Let's say, see, I was never given V final. I didn't really need V final because I could cancel out and then just solve for the, the initial, right? The last thing in this chapter, we're then gonna talk about center of mass, which is basically talks about how you have uh, already the mass, which was a vac factor before that we added, right? But now also the size and basically then uh, configuration of your system becomes very important. So this is center of mass is generally for a system of particles or some kind of extended object, okay? So for example, if you have a meter stick, you can think of like now the, the size of the meter stick is important, right? The shape and thing like that. And then this object has many, many particles inside. So this is not a single particle, it's a collection of particles. And in a way you can say then the gravity acting on every single particle. So imagine that gravity acting on every single particle in the meter stick. Then what do we do? Let's say, how do we balance this meter stick so that gravity cancels out? Well, one way we can do that is by putting force on every you know, particle, right? So every particle then has a gravitational force acting on it, but then we put a normal force in the opposite direction, it's balanced. But the particles are way too numerous, right? So billions of particles inside, you're not gonna be putting billions of, you know, um, let's say uh, normal force. Instead of that, we can do this. We can say, all right, here's the meter stick. It is a collection of particles, but we can kind of think of this, you know, special point. This basically very specific type of, you know, point. We can say that, instead of assuming that all the mass is distributed, we can assume that all the mass is concentrated at one point, we call it center of mass. That means let's say somewhere over here, all the mass is concentrated over there. What happens then the gravity acting right there because other parts have no mass. Now what I can do, think like this, if I put some kind of support at that point and have the normal force acting on it, I can cancel gravity. And you can, right? Think about meter stick. If you put your finger under 50 centimeters, you can actually, you know, keep it balanced. Or think of like a ruler, right? You take a ruler, put your finger under exactly halfway, you're balancing the meter stick. And this is what we have. The center of mass is basically is a cyst, you know, is a is a point, specific point, where you can assume that all your center, right, all your mass is concentrated over there. 
and your system can be balanced. This is also gonna be true, for example, if you have something like this, a system of a couple of particles, right? Finite amount of particles. So you have two objects, things like this. If it is moving with, with, a, with respect to some point out of you know, the center of mass, see then the point, you know, the system becomes kind of imbalanced, okay? So here the, the, you know, the, the blue particle moving ahead of the yellow particle, or if you have this, another point over there, the yellow is moving ahead of blue, but if you have the center of mass moving, right? If you pull it from the center of mass, then the entire system moves together. So that's why it's important to find the center of mass of a you know, system like that. All right. So what we have here is that when, you know, the system will move as if the external force were applied to the single particle of mass M located at that center of mass, as I mentioned. Okay, so how do we find that center of mass? Well, it's actually not that difficult. So let's say if you have two objects like this, you put them on a coordinate system, let's say along the x-axis, you have your origin. So you have M1 and M2, their mass, and then you find their position with respect to the some reference point. So you find X1 and you find X2. Then X center of mass will be equals to this, M1 times X1 plus M2 times X2. That means the, the, the product of mass and position for object one plus product of mass and position of object two plus that, 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 right? As many as you can have then divided by what we call total mass, which is M1 plus M2 plus that, that, that. Just add them together and you have the center of mass. Same thing for the Y center of mass. So it will be M1 Y1 plus M2 Y2, that, 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 divided by the total mass, M1 plus M2 plus that, that, that. okay? So you can talk, talk about even like, let's say extended object, right? Not in like nice, perfect shape and thing like that. So in that case, you can think of like, let's say, to find you know, the center of mass in terms of, you know, uh, let's say this is an ex extended object, take some small piece, right? And find its, you know, its position. And you know, let's say then say, all right, so then I'm gonna find expression for this guy, which is right here, right? So expression, which is the sum of you know, mass times you know, position divided by total mass. But then because it's a, you know, let's say extended object, we would end up actually doing the integral. So if the number of elements appro you know, approach infinity and the size and mass of each element approach zero, then I can use that R center of mass equals one over M integral R dm. I will give you an example in class, you guys can see that. But the idea is that to find center of mass, you're gonna have to do that. Where, which means that you have to integrate if you have a you know, kind of like extended object, like a shape like that, right? For the, for the meter stick, for example, I would need to do the integral. Okay, and I will show you, let's say, in class how to, let's say, get that. But generally, it's not necessarily that, you know, difficult because what we're doing here is, you know, if you have a system of particles, then that, you know, that calculation becomes relatively, you know, straightforward. There's also a center of gravity. So the center of mass is often confused with center of gravity, which are not always the same. So the center of gravity is the average position, average position of the gravitational forces on all parts of the object. It can be determined experimentally. So for example, if I have this object here and I hang it you know, you know, at this position, so then I know that gravity acting like this, so I can draw a line and I then do a, you know, you know, hang it from different position and I can draw a vertical line, then where those two lines intersect, that's my you know, center of gravity, okay? Basic, basic average point where the gravity is acting. All right, guys, so let's look at then our last example here. Uh, four objects are situa situated along the y-axis as follows. Uh, a two kilogram object is at the 13 meters, a three kilogram object is 12.5 meters, and 2.5 kilogram object is at the origin, and four kilogram object is at uh, 20.5 meters. All right. Uh, where is the center of mass of this, this object? Okay, so um, sorry guys, this is a typo. This twenty, there's not twenty. It's it's a negative point five meters. Okay, so negative point five meters. All right. So in a way, what we have is this. So this is being the origin. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Let's say, what we have here is this. We have one particle at thirteen meters. So somewhere over here, thirteen. This is m one y1 equals 13 meters. Um, 
Okay, I think the typo is here like this. All the ones are plus, like this, and all the twos are minus. So, sorry, so that's kind of like we have. Um, uh, <clears throat> this, all right, so. This is actually not 13, but just three meters. So that means this M1 is here. So one, two, three is here. Y1 equals three meters. Y2 is equals to 2.5 meters, which right here. Y3 is equals the origin. And Y4 is equals to 0.5. Right there. And we wanna find the you know, center of mass of the system. So we do X center of mass equals then M1, X1 plus M2, X2 plus M3, X3 plus M4, X4 divided by the, divided by the total mass. Okay. But since all the X1s are zero, so zero plus zero plus zero plus zero, none of them have X position. So we get zero for that. Then we do Y center of mass. So it will be M1, Y1, plus M2, Y2, plus M3, Y3, plus M4, Y4, then over M1, plus M2, plus M3, plus M4. Okay, so this is equals to M1 here is um, two kilograms. So it's two times three, then plus M2 here is three kilograms. So three times 2.5 then plus, uh, then we have 2.5 and position is the origin, so zero, okay? And then plus M3 is four kilograms, then position is negative 0.5. And then this is over, uh, you know, two plus, two plus three mass, right? Two plus three plus 2.5, then plus four kilograms. All right, so if you calculate, I'm gonna get one meters. So now I can say then R center of mass equals X center of mass comma Y center of mass. So this is zero, one meters because it has no X, but Y center of mass is one. All right guys, so this concludes chapter eight.